Hello, I'm George L. Fakhry and I'm presenting the Pet Instrumentation and Processing uh, lecture in this workshop uh, today. Um, here's a state of the union of where we are today in terms of the pet instrumentation. Uh, if we look at the sensitivity that can be accomplished, we are uh, far beyond any other uh, sensitivity available in any other imaging modality at, in the picomolar range at 10 minus 2 molars, uh, 10 minus 12 molars. And absolute quantitation is uh, a strength we can measure uh, not only concentration of a tracer, but also uh, binding potential, um, K on, K off, binding affinity. Uh, our major issue with PET is spatial resolution. Uh, if you look at currently uh, use, uh, use scanners, that spatial resolution is in the range of uh, five to six, four to six millimeters, which tra translates into something at four millimeters, that's 64 to 125 millimeter cubed. And if you compare that uh, to MR, for example, where spatial resolution is one millimeter cube, you see that there's no atomic information really can gather from PET. You have a lot of functional information, but no anatomic. So where we're going and what we're trying to accomplish in the field is get to a point where that spatial resolution here becomes similar to that of MR. So we would be in the one millimeter cube range as opposed to the 125 millimeter cube range. And that would be a huge jump forward, not only in terms of anatomic information, but uh, as you'll see in my next couple of slides, in looking at brain structures that are very small, but that are very important in many of what we look at in PET. So the first example is the rhinal and trinal cortex, uh, which is a tiny structure, centimeter, uh, less than a cc, but that is the very first or one of the very first structures that are involved in a neurocognitive impairment years before clinical onset. Uh, and that's what we see in uh, when we're looking at neurofibrillary tangle tau pet, uh, hyperphosphorylated tau in vivo in, PEA, in subjects. When we're looking at aging subjects, and that's the area where you see the first uh, of those uh, concentrations. We'd like to image that in the CC uh, range. To make things more complicated, and that's what the intramural is. Uh, to make things more complicated, we'd like to also look at the locus ceruleus. And the locus ceruleus is even smaller. It's in the millimeter, but that's the uh, seat of the neuroadrenergic neurons in the brain. Uh, and loss of uh, neuropinephrine in the locus ceruleus is linked to many uh, diseases from neuroinflammation to neurodegeneration, Alzheimer, Parkinson. And now we're talking millimeter. Uh, we can even go, uh, it gets even worse. We would like to look at uh, cortical layers in the cortex because uh, neuroscientists are more and more interested in looking at uh, layers uh, one, two, three. And it has been shown that tau progression, for example, in people aging, um, appears in a set of stages, and it doesn't happen in all of those uh, layers at, at once. Uh, and ultra high resolution PET would allow us to uh, to see that. Uh, the major issue here is that this is a two millimeter uh, range. That's the two millimeter um, mark there, and that gives you a sense of what we're looking for. So. Ultimately, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get to the, the limit we'd like to get at is autoradiography, because when we look at brain slices, we can incubate them with a PET tracer, and then we can look at exactly what you see with immunohistochemistry. Here's an example of an immunohistochemistry, um, immunohistochemistry uh, staining of hyperphosphorylated tau and the uh, compared autoradiography. We'd like to do that in, in vivo. And for that, we need to have a very high spatial resolution. So where do we stand today? If you look at the current scheme of things, we are, uh, the, on this line, you see all of the scanners that have a one-to-one -one, uh, detector to crystal um, connection. And then you see here uh, some of the clinical scanners available. Uh, this is the GE system, the, uh, the Siemens and the Philips. Uh, these are clinical scanners where you see that the resolution without taking into account um, the non-collinearity uh, is already uh, quite a bit high. Uh, this is where we would like to be. Uh, this is what we are building. Uh, and remember, we said we'd like to be at the one millimeter. I'll try to show you some of the results for that system. Uh, and we're down here. So uh, how do we do that? Well, the idea is that you would like to have a coding that is close to one-to-one -to -one between the crystal and the photosensor. Uh, and the reason for that is because if you have a digital scintillator array and an APD that are one-to-one -one connected, 
then you have no coding effect. You have no uh, spatial resolution loss due to coding and decoding uh, and uh, trying to define where the coincidence response is. Uh, so you keep your high intrinsic spatial resolution. And as a bonus, you get maximum count rate uh, with very low dead time and you're insensitive to MR field. So that would allow you to in install any of those systems uh, within an MR scanner. Uh, and we are uh, one of many efforts that are trying to do uh, PET within the MR because it makes sense to have both at the same time. Uh, but there are also costs for this, uh, literally costs in terms of uh, the electronics. Uh, these are uh, highly integrated and compact uh, ASICs, so uh, they have to be done from scratch. And there are very few labs actually in PET uh, in the world who can build these electronics. Uh, so um, this is one component that has to be done. Once the ASICs are done, it becomes a lot cheaper to uh, reproduce those again, but uh, the initial design is expensive. Uh, and then there is also the cost of the high channel number that we're talking about, and uh, very important also thermal load. Uh, with so many connections, you have to have a very good strategy of how you would dissipate that heat. So uh, here's the uh, Savant brain, actually, that we uh, uh, we are building uh, under EO1 on this brain initiative. Uh, this is a scanner that will have uh, about a 40 centimeter, it has about a 40 centimeter uh, diameter, so plenty of space for the brain, 23 centimeter axial, so um, you cover uh, very comfortably the, not only the entire brain, but uh, uh, to have a um, favorable sensitivity profile. And then you have about 258 thousand crystals. That is more crystals than what you have in a regular whole body scanner. Um, and the reason is, although this is a 30 centimeter, not a, a 39 centimeter, not a 79 centimeter uh, bore, uh, the crystals are one millimeter by one millimeter. That's how you get your one millimeter resolution uh, by 15 millimeter. And that means you have more crystals there uh, than the large uh, crystals typically we use in clinical PET. And uh, in order to keep that resolution, we have to measure depth of interaction. So we have two crystals, actually, a fast and a slow LGSO that tell us where the interaction happens at the front or back end uh, to keep our depth of interaction. The depth of interaction is very important because that allows uh, you, from an instrumentation point of view, to keep uh, your resolution the same even when you're going away from the center. So if you look at even at 4 centimeter or 6 centimeter offset, now you're at 12 centimeter diameter, you've covered most of the brain. Uh, we're still at the 1.2 uh, millimeters, whereas if you don't have depth of interaction, that deteriorates very quickly. Here's an example in a phantom that gives you visually an idea of what that resolution is. Uh, this is the high resolution uh, system we're building with depth of interaction. Uh, this is the HRRT, which is the, the best brain scanner available today, really. There are 18 of them uh, that was manufactured by Siemens. It's not uh, supported anymore. And you know, folks are looking at a uh, replacement. That's what we're hoping uh, this would be, uh, ultra high resolution uh, with much higher sense, uh, resolution, uh, spatial resolution, and a similar sensitivity. Uh, if you look here at the events that are being detected, the counts, we have half the counts. So clearly we're gonna have to come up with some strategies on how do we um, uh, control noise, especially when we're doing dynamic studies, which is all of what we do really in brain or most of what we do in brain. Uh, but if you look at the resolution, we are at one millimeter here compared to 2.4 millimeter with the HRT. So you, go, you see already that improvement. And if you look at a clinical scanner, which is what you would be able to buy today, uh, you see you're at three millimeters. So you see the dramatic improvement in terms of spatial resolution. And that improvement continues when you go off site, uh, off center. So here's when we are at um, 10 centimeter off center. So that's way beyond now what we're interested in in terms of the brain because we're talking about 20 centimeter now uh, 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 diameter. And you see here that we are, um, uh, we're still at 1.2 millimeters, whereas here we have lost, if you don't model the depth of interaction, you've lost all information. Uh, here's an example of what that looks like in a brain study. This is an FDG uh, brain study simulated with the high brain, the big brain phantom. Uh, you can see a resolution that looks now starting to, well, now we're starting to look more like an MR scan. Here's a still that gets you um, and, uh, where you can see the precuneus as well as the internal cortex, which we talked about uh, earlier for some of what we're interested in looking at. Uh, all right, uh, this is a comparative slide that gives you a sense of what do things look like uh, compared to uh, a regular brain scanner. This is a conventional PET scanner. Uh, the biograph vision is one of the better spatial resolution. This is the HRT, and you see the dramatic improvement uh, throughout the cortical ribbon, but also the deep brain structure throughout the brain. Uh, you have now a one millimeter compared to a four or five millimeter resolution. 
All right, so are we there yet? Uh, have we reached the limit of spatial resolution? That's a question I've received many times, including from our program director, and the answer is no, uh, because we have not yet looked into the time of flight part of how can that help us. Uh, here, we're not doing time of flight. Uh, what is currently available is a 250 picosecond where you would improve the signal to noise ratio, but not spatial resolution. Uh, what we're interested in, and I'll show you some example of where we're going with this, uh, is the 40 picosecond time of resolution, where uh, you probably will not need reconstruction anymore and then you will start improving spatial resolution and then when you get to the uh, 10 picosecond then you're going to have even a better uh, time of flight uh, resolution than the detector resolution and they will improve for even further spatial resolution. Just as a reminder the positron range in water for uh, fluorine is 0.1 millimeter so and for carbon is 0.2 millimeter so we're far from uh, the limitation in positron range for spatial resolution. So uh, the way we envision this uh, we and others, actually several uh, groups in the field are working on this, is uh, we're collaborating with a European consortium on this. The idea is, uh, well, to look at ultra-fast readout electronics where you get into the 40 picosecond by looking at uh, 3D architectures uh, that uh, would have, um, that will relax the requirements compared to the 3D SPADs and uh, in the SPAD array, and then you would have silicon foam pliers with ultra-fast CMOS. Uh, readout electronics. Again, uh, you know, it's challenging to build the electronics, but once you have them, it becomes uh, very low cost for mass production. And just a teaser, here's what this look, looked like with only four detectors of those. If you had only four of those, but at a 40 picosecond compared to a full ring, uh, full uh, scanner, uh, whole body the clinical scanner today, like the vision. Uh, so the cost here will be a, a fraction of this. And you can see that uh, the image quality is about the same uh, with only four, because now you have an incredible uh, timing resolution you're taking advantage of. All right, uh, so far we've talked about instrumentation, but I would like to also talk about some of the processing where we can push the envelope for brain imaging in PET. And the first is denoising. As we talked earlier, uh, we said that, you know, we will have fewer counts, so a little more noise, and we have to be, uh, we have to find ways of controlling that. Of course, you can extend the axial field, and that's something that several groups are working on. Uh, but uh, that has its limitation in terms of cost, as well as uh, after a certain time, you've covered the brain, and then your sensitivity gain uh, will will not go as fast as you would you, the gain you would have if you had a whole body, for example, scan you're doing. We're more covering more and more of the body, you gain more and more sensitivity. Uh, so here we'd like to look at denoising to improve um, signal to noise ratio. And the idea is to follow on some of the work that was done. Uh, we we're pointing here on some of the work that Ilyanov had done, where they looked at corrupted images and used random noise as an input. And if you did the, that in your convolutional network, you could have a restored uh, restored image that is denoised. Well, well, what we're interested in is what we have done is in incorporating here an MR input as opposed to a random noise because uh, MR is being, uh, uh, every subject that has a pet has an MR, we're using that as an input. And because as we are getting in a resolution in PET in the one millimeter, uh, this becomes more and more pertinent. So uh, here's an example of what that would look like. Uh, this is uh, the denoised image compared to the actually PET acquired image. Uh, and you can uh, appreciate the improvement, dramatic improvement in image quality uh, uh, from denoising. Uh, this is a regular scan, uh, uh, any scan uh, that would be a conventional scan. So you can imagine how this can be improved also in uh, dedicated brain scans. Uh, the second uh, piece I'd like to touch on uh, in terms of how can we improve spatial resolution further is looking at super resolution. So if we are, and we, are, we and others are doing this, looking at uh, optical devices with near infrared light, there have been several groups that reported that uh, you can measure a motion that is less than the pixel size. Uh, that means that now you're oversampling your, uh, your object and you can recover super resolution. Here's an example of what that would look like. This is your regular brain scan. This is, uh, of course, this is the Hoffman Brain Phantom. Uh, this is, uh, that has uh, minor, very minor motion. Uh, this is uh, taking advantage of that motion within the system matrix for reconstruction. And this is the reference. So you can see the uh, dramatic improvement again in image quality. So that's another area of uh, push from several groups to improve spatial resolution. And the last part I would like to show you also 
is partial volume because we talked about uh, the locus ceruleus and the internal cortex and different layers of the cortex. Well, we are talking about one millimeter structures. And even when we get to a one millimeter resolution with PET, uh, we will still have some residual partial volume. So we need to model that and correct for it uh, because in PET, we, all we do is absolute quantitation. So the idea here, again, is to use the MR as an anatomical prior uh, because, uh, especially as we go into resolutions in PET similar to those of MR, the feature from MR and from PAT um, uh, uh, have patch-based similarities, and then we can use those patch-based similarities uh, in a kernel-based reconstruction. So the idea is um, to replace the projector by a KP projector. Here's an example of one of those uh, studies in a FDG brain of a subject. Uh, again, regular brain scan, uh, no high resolution, where you could see the improvement in delineation of all of the uh, brain structures compared to your traditional um, uh, expectation maximization reconstruction. This is an FDG brain, and this is now a, a tau brain in a patient, in a subject, a very early subject, uh, where we're looking at, uh, again, look at the cortical delineation uh, of the cortical ribbon uh, with the uh, kernel-based method compared to the traditional uh, EM. Uh, again, this is a regular brain scan, nothing here fancy in terms of high resolution. You can see how much resolution recovery we're getting. So, um, so the idea is, to do all of this together, uh, motion correction, partial volume correction, as well as uh, all of these resolution recovery uh, with the instrumentation uh, side of things to get to the one millimeter resolution. That concludes my talk. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, everybody in our team uh, here at the Gordon Center at uh, Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, uh, but also uh, at the uh, University of Sherbrooke, where a lot of our instrumentation effort is going on, uh, led by Professor LeCompte, and our program directors at uh, NIBIB and the Brain Initiative, uh, Dr. Shumin Wang and George uh, Zubal. Thank you.